Hello everybody and welcome to CRE Prop Tech. Welcome to Boston and welcome to Boston Properties. We're here in our marketing center today, so uh, we're thrilled to have you aboard. With me today is Ben Myers, who's our VP of Sustainability, and he also has a new designation, is the Director of Health and Security and the repopulation of our buildings, which is a totally new role, but fantastic. And we're so thrilled to have you because so much of what you're going to talk about today, Ben, is so timely to uh, where we're at. Today, we're going to talk about uh, well-being, health and uh, healthy buildings, and then also dive into the repopulation of commercial real estate. And of course, they're all tied together. But for us at Boston Properties, I think, Ben, it starts with sustainability for us, right? And a little bit of history for those who haven't been acquainted with us at Boston Properties. We've probably been at this for about 20 years with a very, very focused commitment. It starts with the early buildings we did with Biogen, great client, and um, still working with them today. Headquarters we did for them out in Weston, highly sustainable building. It was 77 City Point, the first speculative building, and we had to think about totally different way of look, looking at things for um, customers that we hadn't anticipated versus the uh, build-a-suit user. And then uh, our Atlantic Wharf, Boston's first green skyscraper, and then probably where we learned the most then was 888 Boylston, which was our most sustainable building. And the two things that stand out there to me were just how much we learned about air quality and then also natural light. And there's nothing profound about either of those, are there? No, no. I, I mean, they're absolutely essential to human vitality and productivity. And we had been paying attention to them early because of green building and the USGBC's yep. lead standard. So we were certifying projects at the gold and platinum level. Yep. And we were really getting into what's the best ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation rate? What percentage of daylighting should we have in spaces? Looking critically at buildings and modeling these things. So thinking about pandemic response and what to do in this COVID era was a natural pro pro progression of our sustainability practice. Absolutely. We had two um, slides that I think we're going to be able to show on our, uh, our presentation here that we used in marketing. Now, when we used these, the industry kind of chuckled at us. And one was an air quality um, slide and visualization of the productivity. And we were hearing about it anecdotally from our clients in the building that were going like, why do we feel so much better in this building than we did in the other? There was that one. And then also the other illustration of natural light. Now that building, the penetration of natural light, if you didn't use hard walls in areas, was deeper than any building we had ever done before. And you felt it. And those clients that really ran with that and use more glass to bring more natural light into the center areas for their, all their associates in a more democratic way, boy, they, they, they really got the rewards from it. Yeah, it was one of those strange blind spots in the industry. Like When we looked at the science, when we checked out the literature, it was nearly over-determined. Yeah. Right? Light is good for health. It, uh, patients in hospitals recover more quickly when they have a view of the outdoors. We were reading these studies and wondering why no one was making the connection. And then, then we met Joe Allen, Yeah, right? And Joe Allen made it very clear in the built environment the importance of outside air on, for cognitive function, reducing CO2 concentration and VOCs. And we had this aha moment. We've been doing all this yeah. for LEED certifications. How do we take it to the next level? Yeah, back to LEED certification. We learned a lot also in EB, existing building certifications, right? right? We picked up one tower, which will remain unnamed, that had five owners in a 10 year period. Well, we all know that it takes, through our surveys, it takes a property manager about 167 days on average to figure out just how to run a building, right? Yeah. These are pretty sophisticated things. So if you take 10 years with those kind of gaps, there was years when nobody had a clue about what was going on in these buildings. And I think what disturbed you and I the most was what we were finding in some of these buildings that we were acquiring that hadn't been taken care of in the ventilation system, in the water, et cetera. Um, just a tremendous amount learned. And then you bring in Dr. Joe Allen, who taught us the importance of these things. And previous to that, we were just getting studies from schools and things like that that I don't think were resonating surprisingly in our industry, which yeah. blew our mind. 
But when we brought Dr. Joe in on 171 Dartmouth, which is our healthiest building ever that we've been developing and working on for five years, yeah. um, that's when things changed. And you worked with Dr. Joe on putting together our BXP um, well-being strategy. Yeah, our health security task force plan. And, but also our, how the building works in the future for the 171 right. Dartmouth. Right, so for the 171 Dartmouth project, we worked with Dr. Joe to really take our practice ahead and, and wanted to make sure that we could stand by a claim that this is Boston's healthiest office building. Right. So what we did is we extended from daylight and air into materials. Yep. And that was a major leap for our company, looking at red list chemicals, eliminating those chemicals from the supply chain, which is not only good for the occupants of that building, but all the way through the supply chain, yep. right? who's handling that manufacturing, installing it. So thinking more around externalities uh, outside of the building, but also what chemical exposure uh, we're creating inside the building and looking for the right substitutions. Right? You don't want to make a regrettable substitution. You want to find a substitution that's still going to be as durable, as high quality as the original material. So that's been a, a very steep learning curve. And, and one of the reasons why I love sustainability, there's always something new. Right. And, and red list chemicals are, are the new thing. And we really need to focus on it as an industry. Well, it also reinforced to us that these are not commodities, right? Our good friend Roger Martin out of Canada taught us in his book, Design and Business, that these buildings should be designed with the same thoughtfulness that an iPhone has, right? And I think it really helped us when you tie all this together with Dr. Joe Allen, our criteria to have a stance, as Roger says, a stance that says what the building stands for and what it doesn't stand for. Yeah. And if it stands for health and well-being, and it's going to be the healthiest building, everything in terms of decision making on your design follows from there. Yeah, and it's it's so it's such a laser beam in the value proposition, right? You're telling your potential customers this building will make you more productive. It's a lot more potent than saying this reduces carbon emissions, which solves climate change. Right. Which certain subset care about. Everyone cares about being healthy and productive. Right. So it's 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 just a great case. So to complete maybe the circle for our audience here in terms of how you got involved with uh, the health security uh, task force and repopulation of our building and leading our company, your background was construction, your background was sustainability, all the things we just talked about in terms of designing the healthiest building of the future, et cetera. Owen Thomas, our CEO, and Doug Lindy, our president, come to you and say, obviously we've got an issue with this COVID and the health and well-being of our customers, our associates, et cetera, is absolutely the most important. We've got to come up with a game plan to repopulate our buildings. So you take it from there. Tell us a little bit about what that's been like and where you're at. Sure. So, Coop, we had this framework for our sustainability program that was focused on three pillars, climate action, climate resilience, and social good. Mm -hmm. So healthy buildings, were, we were focused on with the Fitwell certifications. We yep. have a Fitwell champion. We were named the 2020 Best in Building Health, certifying more projects by area and by count than any other company in the world. Wow. So we were doing a lot of Fitwell certifications. So we, we strengthened some muscle with that process through our sustainability committee and then moved forward with this health security task force, recognizing that, that health security and the health safety of our customers had to be our top priority mm -hmm. for the repopulation of our buildings. We convened 40 members covering all disciplines across our company. Wow. Directors of engineering, key decision makers, property managers, looking at all aspects of, of our operations to come up with consistent measures that we could implement in all properties uh, to improve health security. Uh, Dr. Joe Allen was embedded on our air and water quality team and our cleaning and disinfection team. Yep. And through these different teams that we divided into five areas, we identified issues all right, just determine what measures we should be implementing and then went forward with procurement because this is all had to be fast tracked to right. get towards a you know June 1 date that we were working towards as a right. company. Recognizing very early that every region was facing different challenges, right? The case counts were different. What was happening in San Francisco wasn't the same as DC. Totally the different. same as New York. The city, the beta between the cities was enormous to me. Enormous. And the, and the leadership was all very fragmented, doing its own thing. Mm -hmm. and I think we're learning uh, the pros and cons of that now, mostly cons in retrospect, right. of not having a national unifying strategy. 
So we wanted to do our part. As a country versus us. As a country versus us. We had a unified strategy. Right. And we probably helped other states unify their strategy by setting an example, right? Sharing out with our, our, our members, our associations, the, our peers with, 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 with whom we conduct business. We were very transparent about what we were doing. One of the things that I think was so great, Ben, that you made an early decision that, that our game plan, our strategy would not be proprietary. You'd offered it up to the industry. Yeah. You'd offered it up to every municipality, and many of them have used it. I think it's, it's ethically wrong to withhold information that could protect public health. Right. So we were kicking the tires looking at what the CDC was recommending, the WHO, what other organizations in China and in Singapore were doing, in Hong Kong, what had been working. Uh, we were looking at the ASHRAE guidance and picking that apart, figuring out how it applied to our assets. And we wanted to be very transparent right. about what we thought operational best practices looked like so the rest of the industry could then absorb those same practices. And frankly, we welcome criticism. Uh, we, we wanted to be transparent. If we weren't doing it the best way it could be done, we wanted to to open up that line of communication. Well, I for one appreciate what you've done for, so much for our industry because there's many late nights where we were on the phone with the city of Boston talking through these details. I know you brought everybody a bunch of comfort in terms of the research that you've done. And one of the things that I think was so great was that Owen and Doug got you connected worldwide. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were touching Asia, you were touching Europe, you were touching all these different continents in terms of best demonstrated practices with our partners that invest in our buildings from uh, these other parts of the world, yeah, which was really great. One thing I, I realized is we have so many influencers at our company. Yes, we have we have people that are highly regarded in in their among their peer group for their real estate expertise. So drawing on them from from Jim Whalen and Tom Hill and Owen Thomas and Doug Lindy, I mean, all these people, Laura McNulty, uh, Steve Colvin, Peter C. I mean, they were all channeling channeling me towards people that could help. And I had no short shortage of uh, what do they call it in, in that show? Uh, who wants to be a millionaire? Yeah, you know, pick up the phone, phone a friend. Yeah, I could I could phone I could pick up phone a, a friend or use the audience. The lifeline, the lifeline of the audience. Yeah. I, had, I had all kinds of support, so it was, that was gratifying. And also on the distribution channels, in terms of picking up PPE, right? It, it, the materials that you needed for us to re-enter, whether it's marketing. Um, the communications, which I totally underestimated them in terms of communicating with associates as they come into a building, yeah. how this is going to work, right. how their temperature is going to be taken is incredibly important. Yeah, our communications team was the lifeblood of our program because we had to get the message out and we had to do it through multi-channel communication. You couldn't just drop a 26 page health security plan and say, boom, that's right. it. Right. You have to message to customers one way, contractors another way, service providers, you have to have short blasts and easy to digest one-pagers. Mm -hmm. You have to have signage that is very clear, right? Right. that people who don't speak English can read. Uh, you have to have signage that's not alarmist, right? You want to send a message like, hey, this is a place where we have a shared responsibility of health security without scaring them out of people. Yeah. Right. You know, let's dump in a little bit of prop tech here real quick yeah. and riff on this a little bit because this is a big part of our topic today, the essence of how do we take these challenges that we have and what's the opportunity for prop tech. So going into this, Ben, um, we weren't taking, you know, temperatures at the door and today when I came into Boston Properties, new technology, getting the um, my temperature by um, What's the mechanism? I think it has to do with uh, infrared. measure infrared on my eyeballs? Yeah, infrared on the eyeballs. Not something I thought we would do when we started. So we had a lot of learning to do on infrared technology, the role of temperature checks and what that would look like, who wanted to do it, who did it, uh, and what it would mean. Because ultimately, only a, a subset of presumed positive COVID cases present with fever. Right. So. You, there are some asymptomatic individuals out there, so you're not going to catch everybody. But what we resolved is uh, health security is a multifaceted thing. So the restrictions on occupancy in an elevator cab and the requirement to wear masks and practicing proper hand hygiene and providing hand sanitizer, all these measures, and I can go on and on, taken as a whole provide a safer environment. You know, the one measure itself isn't going to make it safe. So you still need to be just as vigilant. 
uh, beyond the, the temperature check if you're doing it. Yeah, what I thought was so great was that the user-friendly portion of this temperature check today. Yeah. And this is technology that I had never seen before, but you can see our customers are very comfortable with it, and it takes literally second. Yeah, it's going very well. And it's just incredibly user-friendly as you enter a building. But there's other things that are taking place. We didn't even... We have an app now that I check in on before I go into our office. That's just for Boston properties, right? But we also have apps having to do with the building in terms of I have been checked and now I can um, verify that with security coming in. All these things didn't exist. Now for our prop tech people out there, they may not think that that's a big thing. Right. But one of the challenges that we've had in prop tech is taking technology and applying it to what real estate wants. Yep. And I think we've just opened up the Grand Canyon here with this crisis that you've said. Crisis creates opportunity. This may be PropTech's biggest opportunity. Yeah, it's definitely going to accelerate change. Some of the trends we were seeing are all going to be amplified, and some of them involve PropTech. So I think one of the top ones is the management and communication of indoor air quality. Yeah. Right, More transparency around particulate matter, how many air changes are occurring, CO2 concentration. Yep. We have the sensors now to, to monitor these proxies, if you will. Uh, we're not going to be monitoring for virus. It's just that technology is not going to exist, nor is it really good to try to prove the negative. But in terms of just general air quality, doing more around monitoring is definitely going to be supported by PropTech. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, you and I have talked about the fact that these buildings are going to be really hardwired for wellness in the future, whereas before, like you said, this has been an accelerant. We could have kept marketing our healthiest building to Boston, and it probably would have been a five to 10 year process where people would start appreciating what we were talking about. Yeah. Well, now it's, a, it's just immediate, right? Yeah. So now for us to offer a technology that provides the kind of transparency that you're talking about, we'll actually be welcomed and yeah. appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the stakes are higher. They've totally changed. Right. And customers want to be in a place that they feel safe. Well, you know, the, the opportunity for PropTech to create community has been something that um, the PropTech community has been really challenged with. Like, how do you get a community built within a building and call it opt-in with applications? And um, the app to come into a building may be the vehicle to do that yeah. because there's a sense of community and that we want to be together in a healthy place. Yeah. So this could be an opportunity for that. I know when I fill it out, I'm happy to fill it out, right? Yeah. Happy to talk about, you know, how many contacts, et cetera, where I'm at, that type of thing, where I'm entering. Yeah. It's yeah. going to change a lot. It will. It will. I, I'm, I think there's a bright future for prop tech in this space, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the new technologies. We've been seeing a lot more coming forward with UVC lighting, and, yep. and photocatalytic oxidation and bipolar ionization and all these air treatment systems. We're really trying to figure out now what the clinical effectiveness is in, in, in mitigating disease transmission. Uh, we, we want to really ground all of our decision making in science. And, and, and I'd say science including psychology because right. there's a psychological thing we're doing here as well. Yeah. Right. We want, when I say we want to make people feel safe, that, that's implying there's a psychological need. Yeah. Uh, so we need to make sure we're satisfying that psychological need along with the clinical effectiveness. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that you and I talked about earlier was also multimodal um, work in that we're going to have people working at different times. This was already taking place, but to your point again, it's going to accelerate now. People coming in at different times. There's going to be population spikes in a building that you couldn't even have been tip anticipated before, whereas things years ago in an industrial age was much more predictable along these lines. And my last thing on this is I talked to Ben Weber at Humanize, and I think they've got absolutely the best data in the world in terms of how people are working. And one of the things they're finding is that with the COVID, how people were communicating in inside of their office was really blowing their mind in terms of the differences when you get really highly mobile what behavioral change take place. And also, they're seeing evidence that we got to tick down in terms of working on long-term projects that have high impact versus compulsory things. Mm -hmm. So do you see more of this kind of sensory um, data taking as we enter this multimodal where people are coming in and out of these buildings? I think so. I think we're going to do a lot more accurate population monitoring and flows. 
I think part of that is to know where people are in buildings yeah. so we can more adequately serve their needs. I think it's also just understanding you know, how, what the queuing is going to look like if, we're, if we have uh, people arriving in the lobby, wanting to make sure it's a smooth process through the lobby, not getting congestion. Although I think that concern is going to quickly taper the moment we have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these things will taper. Sure. So, you know, the durability of change is really fascinating. What's going to remain durable yep. post-pandemic? And that, that, I think, is a conversation we all need to be having. Well, everybody in the real estate industry, the veterans always talk about, well, here's what happened post 9-11. Yeah. In the beginning, everybody was, nobody will be on the top of buildings anymore. Nobody will want those high-rise floors. And that quickly changed. And that was something that everybody firmly believed was going to take place. So there will be things like that, right, as we get comfortable with a back to normalcy. But it'll take probably the vaccine, as you said. Yeah, even when we get the vaccine and the therapeutics come along, uh, there's still a risk of zoonotic disease transmission. Something jumps from camel to human or bat to human or pangolin yeah. to human down the road. Uh, and I think we're gonna have a new pandemic resilience. And you're gonna see that the resilient buildings are the ones that are the healthiest. And those are the ones where customers will be able to achieve business continuity through these you know, future outbreaks. If, they're, if this is a dress rehearsal for the next one. Yeah, I love the quote by Antony Slumber out of uh, London where he says, you know, what the world doesn't want or organizations doesn't want is more office space. What they want is a productive workforce. Yeah. And it's our responsibility with our workspaces, the spaces and places, as we say, that drive behavior that we're responsible for. It's up to us to create a product and services that help companies and organizations, our clients, just have the most productive workforce. And it starts with well-being. Yeah, and that's what's going to be durable, yeah. is what promotes well-being. What, With a co-benefit is well-being, meaning that you're addressing COVID, but well-being is the outcome. Yeah. That's always going to be durable, because well-being is always going to provide value. One of the things that I've seen out of this is that there was a question in PropTech having to do with privacy of information, privacy of um, sensors, etc. Do you think that the overall theme of wellness being the goal will help people to get maybe more comfortable? But also PropTech's going to have to good, do a good job of protecting privacy. But do you think it's going to open up a world where maybe we're going to be more welcoming of PropTech in our world of office space to be able to be used? I think right now everyone's looking for solutions. And so there's a lot more inviting atmosphere for right. innovation. And Just like I'm filling out a form saying I didn't have a fever, right? We're, we're all trying to do new things. Right? Yeah, exactly. You're, we're learning how to do new things, right? Right. And so, and we're developing new solutions, and we're partnering with others to come up with new solutions. So, there's no doubt that you know, after the the Black Death came the Renaissance. Yes, I think there's that's something, encouraging, man. I think I think there's something like that, that's going to happen here too, where where this period of of crisis will motivate us to do new things and we'll become more creative as a result. Yeah, I think the creativity is going to be a big part of it and high design as we said with Roger Martin, but also the research I've done in terms of innovation, people think it's all just serendipity. That's There is a certain amount, but it also great companies, great organizations that have innovation, they actually have a process, right, and they've built muscle prior to terms of how to innovate, how to create new design. In a lot of ways, the fire drill that you went through with our team is just going to help us to be a better innovator as a company. Mm -hmm. You drew on all these people within our organization. Probably the first time ever, we had so many people focused on one thing, mm -hmm. and then we took all the resources we had worldwide. That's a process now we understand. I'm very proud of the consistency that we achieved in the regions and the amount of collaboration we had across our whole portfolio. And I would say that the infrastructure we developed to execute our sustainability plan is the reason we were able to respond so quickly to COVID-19. Yeah. So let me hit you with a few takeaways that I've got. First, wellness and sustainability hardwired going forward. I'd say for the building owners out there, travel at your own risk if you're not going to be focused on these two things, because this is absolutely critically important going forward in the future. We're going to operational excellence, Ben. I think before 
it was just, hey, run the building, and it was all about cost and energy and those types of rudimentary things as you look at it now. Now it's a higher calling. Mm. Operational excellence is here. Prop tech, huge opportunity for the wiring of these buildings, mm. huge opportunity for the data, mm -hmm. right? I think it's the founder of Google who said, in God we trust, but show me the data. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be a big part of our industry. Yeah. And there's going to be opportunities for those prop tech companies out there that were looking for a way for their, their product to get sticky. How does it play to wellness? Mm -hmm. It could be a real good way for them to go and sustainability to become important to the building owners. Yeah. Um, focus on design we talked about. Human work has changed forever and it just got expedited as you said. I think this multimodal workplace is here and it's only getting faster and faster. We're going to have to be more nimble as building owners. Yep. And um, I love your analogy on crisis creates the opportunity, right? Yeah. The obstacle is the way, is what the Stoics say. Yeah. Well, this is a pretty big yeah. obstacle. Yeah. So hopefully this is it. And then um, Keep pushing on the process, and congratulations, Ben, on what you've done for Boston Properties. Thanks, Cooper. I, I think it was our early leadership and sustainability that really teed us up to lead in this area. And I appreciate all the all the work through the years to deliver the greenest buildings in, in Massachusetts. And I think it's it's absolutely defined us as a leader. Well, it makes sense that sustainability led to health and well-being, right? This is a total length. What's good for humans is good for the planet. What's good for the planet is good for humans. Yeah. It's pretty logical stuff. Yeah. It's taken a while for our industry to figure that out. But I'd say to all our friends in the audience watching for PropTech, this is your opportunity. The future is about hardwiring these buildings and bringing this technology in to a better operating platform. Thanks for joining us.